So welcome everybody to tonight's Australian Evaluation Society seminar. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. My name is Jessica Haightley brown um, I am a member of the Victorian Australian Evaluation Society Committee, and I'm also a director at the Centre for Evidence and Implementation based in our Melbourne office. Uh, before we kick the webinar off, um, for real tonight, um, I want to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we are all meeting today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I myself am on Wurundjeri land this evening and I invite you to uh, type in the chat uh, the name of the, of the land that you are on this evening. So this event tonight is hosted by the Victorian Committee of the Australian Evaluation Society, or the AES. And the AES, um, as I'm sure you know, is a member-based organisation which exists to improve the theory, practice and use of evaluation for people involved in the evaluation space. And this includes evaluators, managers, teachers and students of evaluation, as well as other interested individuals. And today we are really fortunate to have Dave Taylor, my colleague and friend with us today to lead us in an exploration of tech tools and apps that can support evaluation work. Dave is a senior advisor in quantitative methods at the Centre for Evidence and Implementation, um, the same organisation that I work for. Dave is based in Sydney. He is an experienced economist, quantitative analyst and systematic reviewer with a background in public policy consulting. He applies these skills across a range of complex evaluations in health and human services. And he's also a PhD candidate at Monash University. At CEI, Dave has a reputation um, amongst his colleagues for being an early adopter of tech and he enjoys experimenting with tech tools and apps to enhance his workflow and evaluation products. So there is really no better person to uh, guide us through this today that I know than Dave. Um, but before I hand over to him, um, I just want to uh, mention a few housekeeping points. So. Um, of course, if you know if you have if you're in the up to your eyeballs with homeschooling and you're cooking dinner and you've got a million things going on, I totally appreciate you might want to keep your camera off. But it's so much nicer for our presenters if they can see you and interact with you. So if you're in a position to do so, I do encourage you to put your camera on um, if you're in a position where that's appropriate. Um, Stay on mute the whole time if you can, um, unless we call on you to um, ask a question uh, and answer a question. Um, it just helps the presenter um, to not have that background noise. However, I encourage you to make really good use of the chat function with your questions along the way. We'll pause along the way. We'll also likely have some good time at the end. I'll moderate the chat and monitor that and uh, call Dave's attention to particular things that come through. So make really good use of that. Um, and we'll have plenty of interaction using some of um, these built-in Zoom tools. So without any further ado, um, oh, one other thing I'll say, there's quite a lot of us on this um, session now, more than 50 of us, I believe. So um, if you use the hand up function, I'm likely to miss you. So please type it into the chat and I'll be able to um, keep my eye on that uh, a lot more easily. So uh, without any other hesitation, I'm going to hand over to Dave to uh, take us through his session. Thanks, Jess. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners and the lands in which we're meeting tonight, um, which for me is the Gadigal people. Um, I'm up here in Sydney. Um, and as Jess said, I am a, uh, I'm Dave. I'm a senior advisor at the Centre for Evidence and Implementation. Um, I've been here for almost uh, five years and I've been lucky enough to work on some really interesting evaluations in the human services space, uh, particularly in youth homelessness and child and family welfare. Um, and also uh, I've done a, a chunk of evidence synthesis work. And uh, as you can imagine, you get to wear a lot of different hats in these sorts of projects. Um, it's, it's certainly uh, not a dull day. Um, everything, you know, some days uh, it's, uh, so you, you need deep in project management. Um, other times you're running focus groups. Sometimes, um, and these are the days I love the most, um, I get to sit down and write a lot of code. And um, over the last couple of years, I've, you know, I've tried to look for um, some tools and 
in apps to try and make like the work that I'm doing um, a little bit easier. Um, so that's sort of where I'm, I'm, I'm coming from. Um, and, and hopefully you'll find some of these things um, a bit useful. Okay. Cool, so what I'm hoping you'll get out of this. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that you're gonna sort of log off tonight and have an idea of some, some new things that hopefully you hadn't heard of before. Um, and they may give you some inspiration uh, for, for, for ways in which you can apply them in your work. Um, what, um, you know, I'm not gonna do is, you know, convince you that, you know, as the cartoon says, you can automate everything and suddenly this is just gonna make your life fantastic. Um, I'm also, not everything is gonna be relevant to everyone. We, we all do um, different types of work uh, and some things are gonna like resonate and some won't. Um, but uh, I will say if you have some specific like use cases and go, oh, you know, I've heard that you can use this for this. Do you know anything about that? I encourage you to ask some questions. Um, I'm, I'm by no means exhaustive. Um, there, are, there are many ways in which we can use these tools and tricks and I, I may just be scratching the surface. Um, also, I am clearly not free of bias. Um, I, I have certainly have my favorites here and I'll make a point of calling them out. Um, but that doesn't mean that the other, other things I'm talking about are, are not bad. I just might not have as much experience of them. Um, and there may certainly be things I've missed as well. So before we kick off, I'm, I'm keen to get a handle on um, a few questions just to know where to, to pitch some of my content. Um, so I've got a couple of questions that Jess is going to pop into the chat. I've launched it in a poll. I hope everyone is uh, able to see that. Uh, thanks, Jess. We have about half of our participants responding. The number's still going up. What if it's two? What if it's both? You can only pick one. Oh, you have to pick one, uh, the, the primary one. One or just a handful more people to respond. We'll give you 10 more seconds. That mixed methods option didn't show up in the poll. I think if you scroll down slightly, it, it should just, it's hidden just off the bottom. Uh, thanks, Dave. Okay, I'm going to end the poll now. Can everyone see the results there? I actually can't see it, Jess. Yeah, okay, uh, let me try this. What about oh, here we go. Yeah, great. Okay, cool, cool. All right, so about two thirds of us work in a team, some of us on our own. And we've got a few people to commission the evaluation work too. Nice, and a good chunk of mixed methods, which uh, I put my hand up in there too. Um, awesome, I, thanks team. That, that really helps to know just sort of where things are. So each of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm gonna sort of talk about tonight, they sort of fall into three buckets and they're certainly not mutually exclusive. Um, there are some things that are, you know, might be really to speak to you to working alone. There are some that are gonna really be really helpful working in teams. Um, and then there's a couple of little things that are specifically, I think, relevant to the world in which we are living in right now, which is um, particularly sort of collecting um, information um, when we can't work face-to-face -face, um, or when we can't um, you know, meet other, our, either our colleagues or people we might want to engage with to support our work. So I've come up with um, eight topics that I've, I've, I've developed after chatting with uh, colleagues um, and having a think about some of the problems that I've come across over the years. Um, so each of these, um, so, you know, some of these, like, I start off with some quite simple ones, just, just 
arranging life admin or, or project admin. So finding times for meetings, um, how do we create collaborative agendas? Um, and, and I'm not gonna say automate, but take some of the drudgery um, away from some of these tasks that um, can take up a bit longer than we'd all like to admit. Um, keeping track of our, um, our, you know, our articles and things of interest that um, in, yeah, I think is a, a really useful tool. Um, project management, keeping track of our tasks. Um, how do we sort of communicate with our teams, particularly in pandemic times? Um, making the most of our institutional knowledge, whether that's uh, just one of us or our teams or organizations. And that then, as I, as I hinted at before, things that like you know, running and engaging interactive focus groups and workshops. And um, finally, um, it's a couple of things here that um, are dear to my heart um, for making the most of um, open source um, programming languages um, to support your quantitative work. And then also how to manage um, your code um, and your workflow that goes along with that. Right on. So I, uh, I spend more time than I'd care to admit sometimes trying to uh, arrange meetings. Um, I, I work with uh, some particularly time poor people. And you know, I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only person um, who has been on the phone to multiple um, EAs trying to tee up a meeting um, and, and just going backwards and forwards and round and around going, there's got to be a better way that's just much more efficient. And it turns out there is. Um, I'm, I'm sure that many of you will have, we, we know, uh, will be aware of, uh, of tools like Doodle and Straw Poll. But for those of you who are not aware, um, hopefully this, this is something that could be quite useful. Um, now, there are basically a, a range of web-based tools um, that you can use to sort of yeah, coordinate um, meeting times with the, you know, your colleagues. Um, this is particularly useful when you're working with external partners or perhaps you're working um, with a client and you can't just fire up you know, Outlook or Google Calendar and just see where there's a hole. Um, so, why should you do this? Well, you know, the less time you spend organizing meetings, um, you know, the better. Um, I, this is just um, one of those like no brainers that I feel like, um, yeah, it's, it's a super great. Um, are there any particular like programs or apps here that we, we look at and, and, how, and how, how can you use them? Um, for, so for the arranging of the meetings, I think there's two that really stand out. Um, Doodle is the ubiquitous one. I'm sure most of us here will have, will have copped a Doodle poll at some point. But recently I've come across Straw Poll, which is um, a slightly cleaner interface. They haven't got as many ads. Um, and I think it's just a little bit neater and a bit more professional. Um, up to you though, they both have free tiers. So you, you know, and then there's also a sort of a freemium tier where you, you pay a bit more and you remove the ads and you get a slightly nicer look and feel. Um, the other uh, app that I, I wanted to mention was, uh, was Hyper Context. And this one was previously known as Soapbox. And this one is, is really quite useful for creating agendas and tracking meetings. So maybe you've got a standard project meeting um, maybe you've got a one-on-one -on -one that you, you want to keep track of. And then suddenly, you know, you, you're digging through your, your inbox, trying to find what were the actions and the minutes from last time. Um, and the, the, the beauty behind something like Hyper Context, which um, I've used in a couple of projects, is just to, it brings these things forward um, and centralizes them. So at one point, you've got um, who turned up last time? Um, who, what, what were the things you agreed on? Um, how many of the things are done? Um, and then they just get bought forward to the next one. So you can save time. Um, and the best bit about it is everyone can sort of add in, uh, all of the users can add in their own um, uh, actions or, or items, um, which means not necessarily one person gets stuck with the, um, the very love job of taking actions in minutes. Um, as you can see down the bottom, uh, where do you get it? Um, plug those into your, 
uh, into your URL and um, you can download um, and or actually just they're all online apps um, with uh, with free trials. Dave, before you move on, I've noticed a question in the chat, and I think it might be yeah, helpful to make comment on this earlier rather than later. Um, mm. Some people in their organisations have quite a lot of restrictions on the kind of software they're allowed to download and tools that they can use. You mentioned just then that those three tools are all web-based apps. Can you talk a little bit about what that means um, for people who uh, might have kind of maybe perhaps they work for a government organisation with some restrictions about what software they can use? Yeah, that's a really, really good point, and it's a really good question. Um, so, uh, yeah, by, by a web-based tool, I mean you can log into that as you might log into Gmail um, or Facebook. Um, it's you know you don't need to necessarily download a tool. Um, there are apps that you can get, um, whether they are you know some a lot of a lot of these apps I'm mentioning have like apps for your iPad or your phone. And, um, but many of these are also accessible um, just, you know, through your web browser. Okie dokie. Um, I've just got a little bit of feedback. I was wondering if everyone can go on, um, on mute if you aren't already. Awesome. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only person who has like a downloads folder, um, which is full of like lots and lots of articles um, with names like what I've got up on the screen here. Um, maybe they're things that your colleagues have shared with you. Uh, maybe they're articles that you've downloaded uh, multiple times. Um, and it, it can be a bit intimidating trying to just wade through them uh, and find the one you're looking for. Um, and you will end up just going back and looking for it again, which, which can be a bit of a time waster. Uh, for those of you who don't have access um, or to, to, or easy access, I should say, to, um, to articles, whether they be you know, reports or um, academic articles, it can also be um, really hard just to get your hands on them. Um, and there's got to be an easier way to sort of share these things amongst your teams. And it turns out there, there are. Um, for those of you who've, who've come across um, you know, tools like EndNote and Mendeley and Zotero during your studies, um, they also offer like an incredibly um, useful way to manage a library. And this is something that um, we've done at, at CEI um, to great effect, um, that where we can use, um, we, can, can work, yeah, we can create um, teams, um, can create a bunch of articles or store a bunch of articles in a folder that are relevant to their project um, and we can read them um, and we can also use them um, as you would um, referencing software so you can cite these using uh, a plugin available to word um, now mendeley and zotero are both available and actually and note all have web-based versions as well as actual apps that you can download and uh, yeah, and they all have the sort of pluses and minuses, but they're, they're really, really great to essentially add as like a, uh, as a library, uh, as like a knowledge management tool, or say, not necessarily a knowledge management tool, but a way of sharing sort of resources amongst your team. Um, so this works great, both whether you're alone or in an organization. Um, the one thing I would point out, you know, the, um, you know, the if for IP reasons, you know, you've got to sort of um, maintain fair use. If you work for a, a very large organization and you're making an organizational wide library with 2000 users and you're sharing academic articles, the um, copyright police may be a little bit upset with you. Um, so you just got to sort of make, make sure you're complying with fair use there. Um, that will depend on your circumstances. So what sort of options have you got here? There, there are three big players. Um, and, and really, they, they offer um, similar features. Um, EndNote is, is the big player. It's been around for a long time. It's primarily referencing software, um, and, it, and it does that perhaps um, the best. Um, however, it's not the greatest in terms of like 
collaboration and, um, and, and sort of being able to share this with your team. If you're working alone, it might be a great option. And some you know, organizations, um, particularly academic uh, affiliated ones might have an institutional subscription to it. Um, but for those of us who don't, it's um, an expensive piece of software. And if you're getting that uh, a few times over, um, it may not be the right option for you. Um, both Mendeley and Zotero, on the other hand, um, offer what you call freemium versions. This means you can download it, um, use it, um, but then once you get to a certain size, you no longer, or you might have to pay to get to another tier. Um, I'm a fan of Mendeley. Um, I've just used it for a long time, but I've heard great things about Zotero um, and people swear by it. Um, one of the things of, that both Mendeley and Zotero do quite well um, is that you ha can have a library um, locally on your computer and you can also sync it to the cloud. So over time, you might start to collect a few, a few articles. And if you're anyone like, like me, uh, particularly because I share this with uh, some of my colleagues, we have you know, quite an extensive library and you don't necessarily want to have this all locally. You can sync this to the cloud and you can sort of you know, either download the articles you need um, or you know, have all the ones on hand that you want access to. And as I mentioned earlier, they also function as referencing software, which is their primary goal. So it's a yeah, really useful tool um, to help sort of take, take charge of your, you know, all the articles um, that you might have on hand or want access to. And yep, you can find them all um, at the URLs um, on the screen there. Dave, there's a bit of interaction going on in the chat about these. Um, I might pose two questions. One mm. is uh, someone has um, uh, indicated that they've had an experience where some of these platforms more than others have problems with dealing with grey literature or that they, you might need to take a more manual approach when putting grey literature in versus um, academic articles. Can you make any comment on that based on your experience? Oh, I sympathize. I've had that experience too. So the, the, I, I believe the comment is um, when you import a, a PDF, say, into Mendeley, it tries to um, understand from the, the metadata in the PDF um, who the author was, what the title is, um, and where it was published. And it, it tries to make things easier. Sometimes it gets that right. Sometimes it gets it horribly wrong, uh, particularly if you're dealing with PubMed articles. Um, it's yeah, not the greatest. Um, in those cases, yes, you'll you'll have to sort of manually make adjustments um, to that. Um, but it, it's not terrible um, in you know in terms of getting um, most of it right. Thanks, Dave. And there's another question, um, which feel free to say, uh, you know, we'll get to it later. But um, someone has asked, which is better for text analysis? Ooh, and by text analysis, do you mean that, like, can I search the articles? Andrew, do you want to jump in with a clarifying question? Yes, that's what he means, Dave. Oh, yeah, cool. I, I can't speak to um, Zotero. Um, I know that um, if it, when you open up Mendeley, it's got a PDF viewer baked in, and when you open that up, it will search. Your ability to search the article is dependent on the PDF. So, you know, sometimes, you know, a modern... Well, an article published in the last 10 years, you'll have great searching capability. Um, it starts to get older than that. And that's just the limitations of the PDF itself. So um, I think it would depend on what you try to read. Great, thanks, Dave. Cool. So um, for those of us who are working on a whole bunch of things at once, which I'm sure is all of us, um, and you're looking for a way to help you prioritize your time, um, there, we're living in a golden age for project management software. Um, there has been an absolute explosion of this in the last couple of years. Um, and ideally, um, they might help your team work smarter. Um, they, um, now, this can be really great for you know, whether or not you're alone or in a team. Um, they, it's really good to have a to-do list. Um, and with both within a project and a team-based level, um, at an organizational level, um, at, a, at a, you know, if you have a, a, a project, um, you can quickly get a, uh, a zoom in to see what members of the team uh, need 
are working on um, what's what needs to happen. It hasn't happened um, without sort of you know doing something more manually. Like okay, let's have a project catch up. You can you can see um, and assign um, tasks and and mark things off. Um, and not just from a sort of a project management way. Um, there are there are also um, a lot of them have different templates where you can use for all sorts of things, whether it's like HR onboarding, um, meeting agendas, or um, or specific project types as well. Um, the classic one here we're looking at is, is a Kanban board on, a, on an app called Trello, where you can see like, you know, this is a to-do list. Um, this is my list that I'm doing. Uh, and these are the things I've done. Um, you can color code things based on, you know, like maybe you want to put them traffic lights because there's a, you know, things might be at risk or running behind. Um, and each of these, um, these tiles, you can add files to, you can assign them to individuals, you can add due dates. Um, that's um, Trello is a, is a particularly, you know, um, customizable tool. Um, I, I quite enjoyed using that one, but it's by no means the only one. And as you can see from the screen, there are many, many options in front of us. <laughs> and um, now they, um, these are all web-based tools. So you don't have to download these apps um, and your, which one may or may not work for you is going to be very dependent on you and your organization's preferences, the style of work, um, what you want it for. Each has their strengths and limitations. Um, you may not like any of them. That's, that's completely fine too. Um, in, at CEI, um, we've had, you know, particular, um, my, my colleagues have had particular um, success with working with um, ClickUp. Um, ClickUp is a, um, has a lot of um, free features. You, um, and, and I think that's sort of really sparked it's sort of a, a in, increased interest. Um, Asana is a really um, popular tool as well. Um, I have some colleagues that are using this on a, um, a multi-year um, randomized control trial where they have to manage data collection. Um, so it's a, it's a great way for the project manager to oversee all right, where are each of the things, um, who's doing it, when are they doing it, um, and, the, and the research assistants in the field can mark out, um, okay, this is what happened. Um, and so just feed the information back to the project manager. Um, and it provides like great visibility with just, you know, um, where things are up to and, and, and they can sort of problem solve on the fly. Um, all these apps as, uh, as well, like, as well as being online, they've all got um, phone apps, uh, apps for your phone and your iPad as well, uh, which you may or may not like, because that means your work's following you around everywhere. Um, I, find that useful, um, just choose where the turn the notifications on. Um, Trello is also um, a useful tool. I, I showed just earlier in the previous slide, you can see how there's three columns here, you know, to do, doing, done. Um, you can make those whatever you want. Um, and I've, I've spoken to some colleagues who've actually used this when they're doing, you know, um, qualitative content analysis. Um, they've chosen, you know, a columns or different buckets they want to put, um, uh, you know, different information in, and they've used this to um, as part of their an, an analytic process. Um, and so that's you know that there are multiple ways in which you can use these tools, not just for sort of your sort of standard um, to do list. Um, what I will say though, before you start running off and googling these things, the moment you do, um, you will get non-stop ads on YouTube for one of these things. I, I get monday.com every time I want to watch some Premier League highlights. It's just, it's relentless. Um, once they know that you're interested in project management software, um, it, it, it won't stop. Um, so that's, that's the word of warning I might provide, um, but yeah. Okay, so... How do we, uh, how can we communicate with our team in, in a way that's not um, email, Teams chat or, or text message? Um, I, I feel this is especially important uh, in the times that we're living in. Um, how, how can we sort of like, not just support collaboration, but just sort of check on each other. Um, and these days there's like a, you know, um, 
a couple of like, you know, tools that people have, have tried to market as email killing um, that, and, and as well as that, that, that support collaboration uh, and help teams sort of communicate and work um, together better. Now, why, why would you want to do something like this? Um, for those of you who are with particularly intimidating um, email inboxes, um, this is a way of sort of like reducing those sort of like couple of line emails um, that could suddenly just be a chat. Um, you'll never leave someone off an email thread again um, if you have everyone um, in, in your project team uh, on the same sort of uh, communication tool. Um, and I think the most important thing, uh, one of the most important things is, um, is you can, a lot of these tools have much, much better search functions. Um, so you can go back in time and find out, all right, what did you agree on on this project like 18 months ago, um, which is surprisingly hard to do when you're looking through Outlook. Um, so what are, the, what are the main players? So there really is the, the elephant in the room here is Slack. Um, it, it's an absolute behemoth. It's the industry leader. Um, and I'm also a Slack user, so I'm, I'm highly biased. Um, I, I really like it. It's, um, it's a really great tool. It, um, and also the, uh, I should mention that the, that the, there is also uh, an open source alternative called rocket chat. Um, and just in the interest of like having competition, I haven't used rocket chat, but it's based on the same sort of principles. Um, both of these tools offer like, similar features. So you, you can have like an organizational wide, um, everyone in your organization can, can join the, in a workspace. And within that workspace, you create a channel. So a channel is a bit like you know, a thread you might have on WhatsApp or Messenger with a bunch of your friends. Um, here you might say have a project channel or a channel for people um, that's just dedicated to a particular topic. Um, or particular like members of a particular office where you can just sort of put in chit chat um, or ask questions related to particular um, particular topics. Um, there are like uh, with Slack. Um, what what I particularly like about it is you can you know you can set privacy on it. So sometimes you might be working on a sensitive project and you don't you know you need to control access to information. You can make that private. Um, you can invite, um, you know, people from outside your organization to join the channel. So maybe you're collaborating with people and you would like them to have access to it, but not necessarily to other things. Um, you can do that. Um, and you can also join other organizations like channels if you're invited to. So it's, it's the kind of thing you can um, use to, to collaborate both internally and with other partners who might be using it. Um, Slack has an app you can you download it um, and both for your phone, iPad, and computer. But for those of you who might not be able to download that for organizational reasons, you can also run it inside your web browser as well. Um, the only downside with that is you lose the ability to make phone calls, um, which is also another useful feature as well. Um, I, I would add that like tools like this um, are not just sort of great for you know, communication and productivity reasons. Um, at CEI, we've, we've found it like a great sort of morale booster during pan the pandemic times. Um, it's a really friendly way to like, just fire off a message to a colleague that you might not feel like writing an email to. Um, and, you know, if you're not feeling like it, you can react with one of the many silly emojis that are built in. It's, um, it's really customizable um, and dare I say, almost fun. Um, all right, so this is a, a project that's, uh, oh, sorry, a topic that's very dear to my heart, um, managing institutional knowledge. Um, as someone who's sort of been at the same organization for, for many years, um, I'm, you know, conscious that, the, you know, there's a, there's a lot of stuff stuck in my head. Um, and I'm sure that there, for many of you, there are, there are lots of like, um, are in a similar boat. Um, now, previously, um, institutional knowledge management used to be sort of the domain of large corporate firms where you'd have to have like a custom built tool that, you know, um, specifically allowed you to search through, you know, previous cases if you're a law firm or previous projects if you're a big consulting firm. 
Um, and it was a little hard for like um, smaller organizations or individuals working alone um, or in smaller teams to sort of make use of tools like this. It was just cost prohibitive. Um, these days, um, there are some solutions that are much, much cheaper. Um, and I, you know, I, th I think provide sort of a more off the shelf alternative that, you know, can really, uh, might be worth looking at if it's something that you hadn't considered um, in a while. Um, I hope that the reason for doing this is fairly self-evident, um, but if, if it isn't, like this is a, a great way for you to sort of um, centralize your organizational information. So like, what are, what are the, some of the projects that you worked on? Um, what are some of the things that you've um, like learned about them? What, you know, be the central source of truth. You know, if, you, if you're going onto your, um, wherever you keep your files and there are like six versions of a report marked final, which one is the one that's really marked final? Um, you know, this is where you would store the information so that someone who's just starting out, joining your team, um, can jump on and go like, all right, so this is what I need to know. These are all my, you know, organizational um, policies. And this is also our organization's view on X, Y, and Z. Um, it's a, you know, a really, I think, you know, vitally important tool. Um, then there are, there are two apps um, that are available that like just make this an absolute breeze. Um, one of which here, um, you can see a screenshot of an app called Notion. Um, Notion is, um, uh, you know, it, it, it sort of functions a bit like um, a wiki, like Wikipedia, in that multiple people can edit it. Um, and that, that's sort of its strength. It's, it's not sort of reliant on one person who needs to make a, you know, take charge of the entire thing and run it like you might have um, uh, previously imagined. Um, another is um, Confluence. Confluence is highly customizable. Um, and goes beyond the wiki sort of function. And you can start to use that for collaborative projects. Um, and it sort of starts to blur into the into project management as well. It's a, a very, very powerful customizable tool um, of which knowledge management is one of the functions. Um, whether or not either of these sort of meets your organization's needs um, will really depend on what you intend to use it for. Um, they're all, you know, web cloud-based services. You don't need to download these. Um, would add though that, you know, some of your organizations, you know, you might have rules about like where you can store, um, you know, content um, and access to it. I'd say investigate like the security arrangements um, of these apps and see if they meet what your meet your requirements. Dave, can I just jump in on those security requirements? There were a few questions earlier on about what might be some of the considerations that we should keep in mind if we're using, for example, apps to put agendas up there that might um, be a sensitive project or the point you just made about confluence, um, it could apply to Slack as well. Could you make a comment on data security with um, these apps and tools that you're talking about? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, information security um, and data security is, is something that is, is really often um, underappreciated. Um, checking out like the terms and conditions of each of these things and whether or not they, you know, they meet your IT requirement department's requirements um, is, you know, is, is important. There's a reason that they often don't let you install things willy nilly. Um, some of the, the reasons um, like, you know, if you're working with particular information, maybe you work in health, maybe you work in, in human services. Um, you, and if you have access to particular or have been provided with access to particular information, you all have signed up to things saying that you're not allowed to take, you know, store this information um, externally. Um, so, uh, you know, or, or, and, and so by that, I mean, like, you know, these, some of these services, these, uh, these apps run on servers that are, you know, outside of Australia. So say for example, Google documents might have a data um, warehouse in Singapore. Uh, which might mean that you can't use Google Documents to store, you know, transcripts of a focus group that you did because you only had ethical approval to store the data in Australia. That may not apply to you, but if it, 
you know, it's worth bearing in mind for things like, you know, whether or not you have um, what your, your data security and sharing arrangements are for your various projects and your work. Okay, thank you. So I feel like this is one that's really um, uh, important in, in, in pandemic times. Uh, who, who here has had to try and run a, a focus group over Zoom? It's, it's a lot harder than doing a face-to-face, -face, isn't it? You know, some of the problems that we like, you know, um, face like you know with the, the loudest person in the room um are amplified um in, in, in things when we're, we're in a situation where we're having it online um also if we you know not everyone may want to fire up the camera um and, and really engage um or, may, or they just might find it really hard to you know or really come just not very comfortable with engaging um on an online medium um thankfully there are like a range of tools um, that may make this a little easier for you. Um, you know, no one really wants to get stuck in um, in Zoom hell, and, and and some of these may offer you know ways to you know I wouldn't say increase engagement, but I'd say maintain it, um, keep everyone sort of engaged, um, particularly um, you know if you if you're trying to like engage people over a multiple like you know an extended period of time. Now, I will add, right, that, you know, these apps are, are not going to, like, revolutionize the way you, you know, run an online workshop in that it's suddenly not going to make six-hour online workshops sound like a great thing that you want to do. Um, but they can, if you're breaking things up into smaller chunks um, or, you, you know, they can offer uh, a way of making them a bit more interactive. Okay, so there are a range of, of, of tools here. Um, where, um, so we've got Miro, Kahoot, Poll Everywhere, Mentimeter, and Mural. Um, I have um, limited experience with these, but from conversations with colleagues who have used them, um, they get rave reviews. Um, the kind of features that we're talking about here, um, we, we got things like interactive whiteboards, like you saw on the previous page. This, this here is a screenshot um, from Miro's promotional work. Um, you can see that, you know, there are a bunch of individuals who have logged into this. Um, maybe they're meeting on Zoom, but they've used this as an interactive whiteboard um, and they're dropping um, post-it notes on here. So this is a way that we can still do our post-it note work um, on Zoom. Um, and, you know, people get to, you know, drop in pictures, um, emojis. Um, you could customize this to, um, to meet your requirements. Um, the other built-in things, um, that things like Poll Everywhere um, have an inbuilt, um, oh, an app that you can um, add onto PowerPoint and you can inbuild um, sort of things like live polls and quizzes into your um, PowerPoint slides. Um, this could be particularly useful if you want to sort of get engagement about like, you know, ask a question um, and then, you know, get information and bring that forward. Um, for those of you who like word clouds, um, most of these, you know, have added that as, as a way that, you know, you can sort of create word clouds and mood boards. Um, and Kahoot, um, which I've used uh, or had uh, been participated in workshops where people have used Kahoot is is quite a fun tool. Um, it's uh, it's often used in education settings as like is like a quiz uh, sort of knowledge reinforcement tool. Um, it also does all these other things as well, all the whiteboards and stuff. But you can actually just you know um, sign up for a free account and, and create a quiz, um, and um, everyone can sort of do that on their phone while they might be looking at a presentation on their computer. Um, each of these apps um, have their sort of freemium versions. Um, if you want to get more features, um, you know, you just have to start paying a little bit more. But they're all available um, to work through your app, uh, sorry, through, through the web um, and, you know, may offer um, what you're looking for in order to sort of engage your audience.
Right on. Um, so this is um this is like my my favorite topic. Uh, <laughs> making the most of uh, open source programming languages. So why would you want to do this? So um for those of you who, who do quantitative subjects at uni, um they often like you know train us on things like SPSS and Stata, um and, and, and why because they, they get free licenses um, and it's it's cheap for students um, and the, the companies do that so that when you leave, you have to then stump up a couple of grand to get SPSS or Stata um, and, or your organization does. And that can be really hard to justify the expense, but you know, you've know you spent a couple of years training on this thing and you're like, I, I, I need to use something. Um, I can't use Excel, um, what, what can I do? Now, over the past you know, 10 years has been an explosion in interest in data science. Um, and, and with that have become you know, sort of the rise of the programming languages. So um, things like R and Python and Julia um, are now pretty standard um, you know, tools in the, in the quantitative analysts toolkit. So why should you abandon Stata, um, SPSS or MATLAB? Um, well, it's entirely up to you if, if you you know, you want to run with that. Um, and, and, but for those of you who might be struggling to justify the expense um, or running up against limitations, um, the, the particularly um, these open source tools offer um, a whole new world um, to engage in. Um, they're open source, by that, by that I mean that they're, they're, they're free. Um, they go through rapid development cycles. So you're, um, they're, they're constantly being updated. Um, there is a there are packages available for every conceivable type of analysis that you may be interested in. Um, whether it's just I just want to make pretty charts or I just want to clean some data through to structural equation modeling, deep learning, um, or like text analysis, um, absolutely anything. Um, there, there is usually a package or often multiple packages available to do this. Um, based on your preferences or interests. Um, one of the things that I've, I've really noticed um, over my years using them is that there's a really enthusiastic community out there that provides support. Um, for those of you who might be intimidated by the idea of like coding, um, it's you know, a journey that many people before you have, work, uh, have walked, walked on and, um, and, there, and there's a lot of support available out there um, and resources that are really well put together um, that can help you intru introduce you to these sorts of things. Um, and finally, and I think one of the most important reasons why um, coding is perhaps superior to the old point and click work is that it's, it's uh, support through reproducibility. Um, so for those of you playing along at home um, who may have noticed that, you know, over the past decade, there's been a bit of a crisis in psychology research in particular, um, where, um, you know, people have been really struggled to, to, to replicate results that might have been um, done in other, in other settings. And it's been really hard to verify results, um, particularly because like the, um, uh, you know, model of raw data might be there, the particular analysis that might have been done um, is is not available because it wasn't done in a way that um, allowed people to sort of uh, record what they did at each stage. Um, coding sort of literally is the opposite of that. Um, you can uh, you have to describe at each point what you're doing, um, and so the idea that I you know I could write something, I could share it with any of you, and if you have the same data, you should be able to get the same result. Um, is just a really important. You know, tenant of science. Um, so this, you know, this sort of approach, um, you know, really does support that. For those of you who, who care about re reproducibility and, and research, um, uh, you know, this offers an avenue for that. Um, so, what what are your options, and does one offer an advantage more than the other? Um, so, I'm going to admit a very very strong bias here. Uh, I I'm an R user. Uh, and I'm an R advocate. Um, and I'd recommend R. That's not saying that like, you know, uh, Python uh, and Julia um, have, you know, dedicated users who swear by it. Um, and they, you know, you could have someone else saying exactly the same thing um, about either of them. Um, where can you get it? Um, this, you know, really easy to find. Um, fire up your search engine. Um, 
plug it in. Um, there are links here to, to R uh, and it's most popular. Uh, what's called an integrated development environment. This allows you to, just to, to actually run R code and um, they're both free, easy to download, updated regularly um, and really, really uh, quite good. Um, in terms of like, you know, if that seems like something you're interested in uh, and, and, you, and you wanna get, you know, some help. Um, if you typed in R help into your favorite search engine, you would be intimidated with the uh, amount of resources. And that actually might make things difficult because there's no you know, easy place to go to start. There is a free, um, there's a textbook published by a R guru called uh, Hadley Wickham called R for Data Science, uh, which you can purchase as an actual book or you can purchase the online one. So not purchase, just access the online version. Um, and you know, there's a great introduction where it literally just tells you how to install it uh, and go from there. Okay, so say you've decided to go down this route or you have gone down this route and you're working with, you know, a colleague um, on an analysis and you're trying to share code. Um, maybe you're trying to work on the same thing um, and you want to make sure that, you know, you're working from the right version. Um, or maybe you just want to, yeah. Um, so how, how can you make sure that, you know, you get on top of this? There are... Um, there's a, a particular like a platform and a language that sort of come from the world of software development um, that is really useful um, for just you know data science and quantitative analysis in general. Um, it's called Git, and it's um, essentially a version control platform. Um, it it supports you know um, collaboration. This is a rather complicated diagram, um, which we really don't need to need to know the nuts and bolts on. Uh, shows you how it principles it works. Um, but the, the idea is that you have a central repository. Um, normally, you know, uh, it can be up in the cloud uh, where you store a centralized version of your code. You grab that, you make some edits, you send it back, um, and then your colleague can then grab it from the central repository. So the central source of truth remains up in the cloud. Um, and the best bit about all this is that you can go backwards and forwards in time. So if you um, realize that actually you wrote something last week, it was really, really good, and you accidentally deleted it, you can, you can go back and bring it back. Um, and you can just, like, it really, really supports um, working um, collaboratively, um, particularly, um, you know, on, on the same piece of analysis. Um, uh, you can write something, you can send it, um, up to the repository, um, your colleague can have a look at it, um, give it a quality assurance, um, you know, do, check if they get the same results as you, um, and then, you know, either, you know, make some edits or, or, or mark that as done. Um, but it's not just really good for, you know, organizations, um, you know, it's, it's really just good practice for anyone working alone. Um, for the, the reason I mentioned earlier, like you, you might accidentally delete it, um, or like, you know, in, in the case of my dear dad who called me this week and said, ah, I've lost the code for my research project. Can you help me find it? And I was like, oh, so where is it? On a thumb drive. I'm like, okay, this is gonna be fun. Um, and, you know, the, this is like a lesson in why, you know, if, if it used GitHub um, to store the code, it, it wouldn't be having this sort of conversation about like, how can I um, restore something from Dropbox? It's, um, uh, a really, really powerful um, tool um, that's free. Um, and there are multiple ways to sort of engage with it. Um, so at a, at a high level, so like, you know, Git is, is, is the language itself, um, but there are like four platforms you can use to make sense of it. Um, GitHub is the most famous, uh, well-known. Um, there's also GitLab, Bitbucket, SourceForge. Um, there are, you know, free and freemium options um, and a range of like, you know, tools and programs you can use to sort of take your code and send it up to one of these things. Um, GitHub's got, you know, for the, for the novice user, the most like accessible documentation. And if you search GitHub help, you would be like, uh, you know, it'd be a good place to start. Um, the thing I would add um, to bear in mind, though, is, is these, these platforms are based on the concept of, sort of open source software development. So their default is to share with the outside world, 
you may not want to do that. Um, you know, maybe you're doing some analysis that you know you don't actually want to share. It might be you know code that you consider your intellectual property. It might be draft code that you don't want anyone stumbling across judging you for. Um, so you can set your um, projects um, to, to private. Um, for some of these um, platforms, they offer that free. Some of them you have to pay for that. Um, you can also create like, you know, uh, an organizational account on one of these platforms and then invite your colleagues to it um, or collaborators and then control access. Um, what I would mention though is that you should never store your actual data um, on these platforms um, for the same reasons we mentioned earlier. Um, your data should live somewhere safe and secure, but this is just a place for your code. Um, to get it, fire up your favorite search engine. Um, really easy to, to, to get up and go. All right, so we've got a few minutes left for some, some questions. Um, I, I know we, we're probably not going to be able to get to everything. So just preemptively say that, like, you know, if you don't have your questions answered um, or you, you want to have, a, you know, you have something that you're wondering about a bit later, um, you can flip me a line on Twitter um, or on LinkedIn. I'm more than happy to have a chat. Um, so just thought I'd throw that out there. Um, but yeah, thanks, everybody. Thanks so much, Dave. Um, we do have a couple of lingering questions in chat. So I might start with those and invite other people to pop other things in chat and or follow up with you on Twitter and LinkedIn, given the time. Um, one thing just to backtrack into the open source software um, like R, Python and Julia. If you've been trained in SPSS or Starter or MATLAB, is there a particular option that offers the lowest barrier entry? So if you are coming at it with skills from SPSS or skills from Starter, is there one that you would recommend starting with? Oh, I, this is really down to personal preference. Um, and I, I, I personally think that because R is, is designed primarily as like a quantitative analyst sort of language, I would suggest that's a good place to start. Julia and Python are things, you know, they're, they're higher level programming, lang programming languages. You can use them to, you know, people, they're, they're, they're more than just sort of, they go beyond sort of the statistical anal analytics kind of thing. So um, R is probably a good place to start, but I don't want to discount the other ones. Mm, people thanks, love Dave. them. So if, if someone has, um has gotten pretty skilled in using the syntax function in SPSS. Do you think that would be a skill that translates to coding in R? Um, I think it would just translate to, you know, coding in general principles. General. Yeah, it's... Thanks, Dave. And another lingering question in chat from a while back um, was about Slack and about um, whether or not you'd recommend that for use with externals like clients and so on. Yeah, great question. Um, as with all these sorts of um, tools, it it would just depend on what you wanted to share. Um, you know, uh, it's the same. I think the same thing would go with say things like Trello. Um, you, you would you know you could have an external facing um, project that you wanted to track. Like you know maybe you used it to track your your action items. Um, maybe you wanted to centralize one of those like risks in action registers um, that you know you often see doing the rounds and email inboxes and spreadsheets you can try putting them in one of these um apps to make them you know a little more user friendly um it's it's really up to your personal preference um you you, you if you want to do that there's absolutely no reason why you could mm. Thanks, Dave. We might draw a line under it there. I can see that there's still comments and questions coming in, but in the interest of time, we will let people log off and go and get dinner. Um, and Dave, on behalf of the AES Victorian Committee, we want to thank you for, um, for your excellent session today. And I want to thank all of our attendees for their engagement, for their suggestions that came through during chat as well. Really cool to have the hive mind um, getting activated and for all of your questions and comments. So, Really appreciate everyone's participation tonight.